side. Today I want to show you some of the fascinating visual material that is the charts, the history of the cathedral. It all looks very calm today, and everything we're walking into a, a totally well preserved early 13th century building um, here in the big 13th century, but it's gone through a lot of vicissitudes and um, it's fascinating. Even what you think of as very recent material, the photo here is only about 40 years old, but already the, the whole of Patrick Street in the bottom is gone, and as you can see at the moment, major developments on Kevin Street. It's an interesting viewpoint because it shows you the small area, 100 or so acres, that constituted one of the city liberties, the Dean's Liberty, and right up to the Ivy Building of Monsanto Park, just outside down to Kevin Street. That was his, his little um, sort of city that he controlled um, uh, and uh, uh, had its own particular rights um, until it was all abolished about 1840. And going right back to 1610, there's a long history before that, but just nothing visual and probably one of the most reproduced maps of the city, the John Speed one. But although people tend to look at the streets and the centre, um, St. Patrick's gets a little overlooked um, and if one comes down to the bottom of the image, um, there we have, you see the arrow there is the cathedral, but also a reminder that the city walls didn't just stop up at Christ Church Place, uh, there were outer walls and even between them, just below the cathedral, the ch Chancellor's House, if you looked after the choristers of the cathedral, um, now where Kevin Street runs and um, part of the sort of the grounds that constitute the outer buildings of the cathedral on the, on the south side. This is probably the earliest view of the building. Thomas Dingley um, has unfortunately put everything really in the same plane, and so buildings, the small ones at the bottom there, the houses, which are probably around this corner, all seem to be actually attached to the front of um, St. Patrick's that we're looking at. He made a journey to Ireland in 1678, and he illustrated his journal with little vignettes like this. It's now in the Royal Irish Academy. And um, from the point of view of the city itself, the, the little sort of proto Dutch Billy house on the right hand side, which you really find starting about 10 years later in the, the Coombe area, and already appearing with sort of curved E. In the gallery's own collection, not a fascinating drawing, but um, I didn't really realize what I was looking at um, when I was examining it to find out more about Donnybrook. It's by Francis Place, it was drawn in 1698, and it's actually titled um, as uh, Dublin from Donnybrook Bridge. There was no bridge at Donnybrook. What we're actually looking at is Balls Bridge, which is just a little further down the Dodo. Um, and in between the foreground and the cityscape, right in the distance, there's all this open land. This was land that belonged to the Fitzwilliam family, later developed the Georgian and Victorian Dublin but at this time completely unused. The drawing itself is uh, exceptionally narrow um, and long. This is a gives you an idea of the, the size. And so you do really need details. And on the left there, there's this enormous church, which has to be St. Patrick's Cathedral. It does seem that the Minot Tower of West End is somehow coming to the centre of the crossing, but bear in mind this is a tiny little detail of place of recording. He's very punctilious in what he puts down in his notations. Um, what gives it a, a, a sense of authenticity is the fact that on the right hand side you can quite clearly see the town of Christchurch Cathedral and the rather curious steeple of the old merchants' exchange of the Tulsa, which used to be opposite where the, the Jury's Hotel now stands. You also have on the right hand side the castle that was on Bagot Street um, at the junction um, with Waterloo Road today. And coming in even closer, the old St. Kevin's Church, just south of us, um, is rebuilt in the 18th century. There's no trace of the medieval building, and this, um, again, is a very rare record of that. The cathedral authorities decided. Um, in 1733, that they really needed a proper survey of the buildings, and so they brought in Jonas Blaymire, um, and uh, I, I rather like the sort of historic titles here, the, the, 
the South prospect of the cathedrals of Patrick's Dublin. He made originally the Bosch drawings, then they were engraved as a set. Um, and we are to hear from the South Side was a transept, now you can see the Minute Tower in the correct position. He was a surveyor and measurer, probably came from Yorkshire um, and died in Kilkenny. Uh, in this particular image, um, the perspective is, looks a little strange, only really because it's a pull-out. You can see the folds, the vertical folds on the sheet um, from the book that uh, came with his um, engravings. Um, and obviously can't be got quite flat to photograph it, but um, it does have um, all sorts of interesting information on it. Where we're positioned at the moment in Lady Chapel on the right, this was an um, untouched 1260s building at the time. Um, and you can see just how high the land around had risen because the, the windows, you can see they actually look at the ground level. Um, uh, it, it, they are the same windows, but it was until later that that was um, excavated back. St. Patrick's was always in a hollow. Um, it always had problems with flooding, and the, the River Poddle, which um, comes off to Libby, supplies the moat to the castle, and there was one, comes down the side of Patrick Street, where it's diverting into the coom. Um, that frequently flooded, um, and uh, it brought extra debris around the cathedral itself. We've also got, you can see, a clock on the south um, transept, only one hand, as was quite common still at this date. Guillaume Delande, a French engraver, um, probably never came to Ireland. Um, he was based in Paris, he's known for cartography, and he did actually do the engravings of Kansas Kilkenny the same year as this 1739 engraving, which was commissioned for a book, like many of these um, images, the whole works of Sir James Ware concerning Ireland which uh, have to include a few views in it. Um, rather like Leymar, his perspective is a, a little strange, but um, it's interesting to see the sort of tracery in, in the, the windows. Um, and the rather domesticated quality of that side chapel down the bottom left, which is uh, abutting the south transept at the time. We also have the introduction of a fireplace so to keep warm in winter. Um, it, not, it becomes clearer in the moment, but you can see it there just on the left-hand side. The cathedral was definitely starting to decay. Thomas Cooley, 30 years later, 1769, um, did a report and said that the decay of materials in general was obvious, um, but all expensive attempts to restore any part of the fabric should be scrupulously avoided. Um, uh, I think as a classicist, he really thought this was a bit arcane and she was swept away and something nice and new put in its place. Um, he did undertake some practical measures, um, as he said, rescuing the walls from being water soaked, and I said there was flooding, and even using straps to stop the south transept windows from coming outwards from the building itself. The first um, Fan that gives you an idea of the circumference of the cathedral air and its liberty um, was commissioned from Roger Kendrick, it's now in Marsh's Library. Um, and here you can see what we had on the initial aerial photograph of sort of the encompassment and some of the divisions. A lot of clergy lived in the liberty, but there were also many tradespeople. Um, it's strongly Protestant to this day, by the 19th century, um, heavily Catholic and quite a poor population. Um, but it, it, it was a little world that belongs indeed. It also underlines the fact that the access from the deanery um, in the mid bottom there um, to the cathedral was quite awkward. There was a little alley, it was still there. Um, but in fact, the close that you now come off Kevin Street and through Patrick Street, that wasn't there. Um, and so it was really a, a building that was hemmed in on all sides. Better idea on the famous Dublin map by John Rock, um, where he puts these pictograms, and you can see um, the houses and some of the gardens marked. Um, and uh, as I was just saying, it's uh, um, the way that the cathedral and the deanery ran really right into Marsh's Library on the right hand side, and the Archbishop's Palace of St. Sepulchre. 
and I moved to the 19th century just because the great panorama of Dublin that John Smith produced and was, was given free with the Illustrated London News um, gives you a, a real sense of the, the buildings and the city. Now, he takes certain licenses because, I mean, this is a, a really tiny detail. The, the panorama is a couple of meters wide, it's very large, a woodcut. Um, but again, it gives you a, an impression of that there's a deal in there at the bottom um, and just across obviously, the cathedral, and you see on the right hand side the Archbishop's Palace, Marshall's Library. So, um, all nicely enclosed behind gates, and very much its own little world. Um, at this date, still, the main thoroughfare across is actually on the other side, what's known as the Patrick's North Close. Um, and in fact, this becomes quite a busy little highway between Patrick and Ride Street on the other side. Um, here you get a, a better idea of this woodcut. It's still a detail, but it does um, underline the relationship of St. Patrick's to Christ Church up here in the old city. The first artist to really give us a good impression of the building uh, is James Moulton, um, famed for his engravings of the city, 25 of them produced between 1792 and 7. But these are based on very large watercolours a um, number of which are in the gallery of collection, including the two of St. Patrick's. Um, 52 by 76 centimetres, it's a pretty massive watercolour, um, and it allows him, obviously, to depict in very, very fine detail um, the, the building itself, the, the perspective is proper, you can see all its elements, um, and um, again, the, the, the Lady Chapel on the right-hand side, um, literally standing uh, above the, the, the ground, he, I have to say, he exaggerates a bit. I mean, it doesn't make the, the churchyard look um, rather larger, I think, than it probably was. You get a sense that this is an enormous <coughs> area on the south side. Um, but, um, again, little, little details that you just wouldn't expect to see. The, the wall that's suddenly there between the, the transept and, uh, the, uh, the, and, and Syria buildings in the south. Um, here, much clearer, that chimney uh, abutting the, the south transept. When you get the engravings, uh, they came actually uncolored, but around 1820 they started to be uh, produced in, with watercolor finish, just to make them seem more attractive. But um, you not only lose the scale, I and mean, there's a lot of detail still there, but of course you, you don't have the subtlety of the original artistry. He had been, we believe, in James Gandon's um, uh, studio as an apprentice architect. Uh, they fell out, and then in 1791, just before he left the city, he did this enormous survey of the major public buildings, um, resulting in exhibited watercolours like we've just seen at the Royal Academy, and then the set of engravings, which he later produced um, as a book in 1799, with his own text, which is actually quite interesting as well. This is the, the first record of the 1749 spire that George Semple put on the Millen Tower, um, adding no less than 100 feet, uh, 30.5 metres, to it. And there's a rather nice agreement on the 13th of May 1749 with John Umston of Drotherville and George Buckton of Kilgobbin, both stone cutters, to actually build it in granite. Uh, it wasn't favoured with everyone. The 19th century Journal of the Ecclesiologist uh, described it as a lump of stone, um, which is, of course is accurate because it was a bit rather uh, uh, dismissive as well at the same time. Uh, the other nice thing in Morton, of course, is the figures. Um, uh, here, um, people are looking at two stones and a very earnest cleric is looking up um, at the choir in the distance there. You can't really get a sense of the Morton today because not only the 19th century memorials that have arrived outside, um, but of course the trees have grown. Um, and um, it would be nice to go back to Morton's view, but I don't think much enthusiasm in cutting down trees. Um, uh, it's also not um, publicly accessible um, uh, and can only really be viewed from a distance. But the there is the, obviously where we are on the right hand side, the Lady Chapel. I just wanted to come in to show the, the detail there. Um, Around the city, you see tradespeople, uh, people um, enjoying themselves, carriages, and all sorts of other detail of George and Dublin in the 1790s. It has been noted that it is always sunny in Morton's views. 
uh, here of course is what the exterior of where we are now looks like today um, following the, um, the great makeover which we'll be coming to the uh, Benjamin Lee Guinness's um, remaking of the cathedral in 61 to 65 um, when so much was shored up um, parts were replaced um, and the outside was enhanced uh, what reason to show you here is just to make the point of how we're now back to the proper ground level and you can see how high the sills of the windows are from the grass. We have another um, a detail here of the, the, the Blaymire um, and uh, just sort of showing you in the, the south transept and the door and uh, I think it underlines the sort of rather curious perspective. Um, these early surveyors tend to sort of treat the buildings in isolation, not really just in the surroundings. There's some sense of ground. You don't really get the sense of being in real space. And certainly compared to, as I can see, the, the Morton watercolours. We also got a landscape, which is quite nice, and the tree there. One well, has to, to wait about 30 years for um, the next really interesting view of the cathedral. Um, and again, it's for a book, this um, rather ponderously titled <coughs> William Monk Mason, um, History and Antiquities of the Collegiate and Cathedral Church of St. Patrick near Dublin, from its foundation in 1190 to the year 1819. The book came out the year 1820 and had many illustrations um, in it, uh, the two main ones cathedral plan and the south perspective which you see here. I think once Morton had fixed that um, place to look at it from, everyone sort of copies it because again you see it again and again. Um, with slight changes, um, you obviously includes a few of those houses on Patrick Street um, and uh, the, uh, you still see the clock. And the arrival of a rather interesting urn monument um, was then practically the only uh, freestanding one actually out there in the, the churchyard. It's coming into detail, you can see there, uh, it is against the choir uh, tombstone being uh, examined. One sort of suspects it's uh, cleaned things up slightly, and yet using his lighting very skillfully also to sort of bring out the, um, the building. If it all looks secure, I'm afraid counts, uh, the accounts at the time really continued rather dire fashion. Um, back in 1806, John Carr, a stranger to Ireland, um, described the neighbourhood as more mud, rags, and wretchedness than London can exhibit in its most miserable quarters. Um, 1810, Nathaniel Jeffries, um, in his Englishman's descriptive account of Dublin, um, uh, underlined the unfortunate location. Um, and uh, uh, decided that Gothic magnificence of English cathedrals was decidedly lacking in St. Patrick's, um, in this narrow, dirty, and obscure part of the town. Um, 1820, bang up to when this publication came out, and Thomas Cromwell's excursion through Ireland, um, he reckoned that to totter into irretrievable ruin seems to be its no very distant doom. Um, interesting pile, um, but the dead wall and disgusting huts which surround it are certainly no ornamental appendages. It was inferior in every aspect to the numerous remains of Gothic architecture in England. Uh, I am mean, hardly had that Jeffreys and Cromwell were visitors to Ireland, um, uh, and, uh, but certainly at this time um, poverty was arriving. Uh, the Irish the fabric and clothes trade had faced punitive taxes in the mid 18th century, effectively the weavers and the coom, and many of them had homes um, around St. Patrick's. And by the 19th century, uh, things were getting quite dire, and the poverty was getting quite widespread. Just uh, coming in on that, that monument, because uh, um, it does become rather a feature of the views at the time. This is not easy to see. Um, George Petrie um, was already becoming established as an um, antiquary, and he was called on 
um, to provide illustrations for um, one of the, the new crop of guidebooks that were starting to um, appear around 1820. These original drawings from the Royal Irish Academy, um, and although they have a certain sort of ghostly quality, actually there's quite a lot of detail um, to them. This is the publication that he was working on at the time, this uh, um, George Wright's historical guide to the city of Dublin, which is a mine of information. This has uh, come out in a reprint, and um, it's full of social information and um, real uh, insight into how the city worked um, at the time, and of course how visitors saw the particular buildings. This is the actual engraving that resulted from that ink wash drawing. Uh, uh, Thomas Higham, um, was brought in, and um, it's almost about the same size as the drawing, but quite small, um, uh, and you can see the book plate here. The thing that was engraving is that they, if anything much more specific, it can't be quite so vague, um, and so you do get a lot more detail filled in, and visually a bit more satisfying. But even down uh, the, the touch of the smoke of the chimneys and the houses in the distance, there was a lot of piracy going on um, at the time. William Topham clearly um, just stole that image and reworked it for another famous guidebook um, of Ireland's, uh, oh, sorry, the Halls of Ireland, its scenery, character, etc., um, which uh, came out in 1843. Um, and yet again, there is that same monument that sort of seems to become a fixture of views at this particular period. I rather like this than James B. It's for, for James Barrow's tour of, of, around Ireland of 1836. Um, and although, uh, from an artistic point of view, he's quite a modest talent um, and perhaps doesn't tell us anything particularly new um, about the, the building, um, he has an eye for characterization. You can see this, this very elegant couple there, but clearly on the way to morning service, and the sexton with his pick in the background. Lot of figures, possibly helping, waiting to be helping with preparing a new tomb. One of the most curious images um, is by John Cook uh, to coincide with the royal visit of George IV in 1821. He produced what we call Cook's Royal Map of Dublin, um, and around it there are 24 little vignettes of public buildings. I think rather significantly, the only church is St. Patrick's, and not because it's a great Gothic theme, because it's so venerable, it's so much part of the whole history and fabric. And he's really highlighting more modern buildings, and you can see here the James Gandon's Custom House. Um, but why he should decide to literally crop the Malton view and just show the south transept and the choir is a rather um, uh, unexplained, and it does give a rather odd look um, to the building itself, but we've still got the minute town. Far in the distance. Um, here you see the map in all its glory. It's an early example of colour lithography, um, and he shows the sort of uh, slightly outer areas of the city in this blue. And as you can see, it's a very splendid uh, uh, grouping of um, uh, 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 buildings around. We've been looking at the south side, so I'm, I'm literally moving around to the north now, and we're sort of going back to John Blamar with his survey and the engravings. Um, and um, really, um, because uh, this uh, shows you something which uh, doesn't return for quite some time, which is actually an intact north transept. So it's all moved and the whole building is actually standing. Um, it began to suffer and um, it would look as if the the river Hoddle was actually much to blame. I mean, it had been walled off from about 1354, um, right up to the 19th century, as a separate church, um, replacing um, St. Nicholas without the walls, which had, had, had been demolished. Um, but um, there's a series of events. 1784, incessant rain and even snow caused um, not just the, the Poddle, but the, the Liffey and the Dodder to burst their banks, and water flooded down from the castle yard north of us, um, six feet in the cathedral, according to Walker's magazine. Um, it made a ruin of the north transept. Um, it took some time to, be, to recover from. 1794, there was another flood, and again, the Liffey burst its banks. They actually had to use boats to get down Patrick Street. 
1799, James Walton, in the description of his book, um, the picturesque and scriptive view of the city of Dublin, um, describes uh, very accurately the, the situation that's being built in a hollow, which occasions the whole church, even the surrounding close and contiguous streets, of, at the time of heavy rains, to be underwater, even to the depth of seven or eight feet. This keeps it very damp and dirty, um, and is bringing it quickly to ruin. Um, you also noted, as everyone else did, the, the meanness of the surrounding buildings. And you get some... I have jumped. Sorry, you we'll get some sense of that um, in another James Morton watercolour. I think you can see why he didn't choose to engrave this for this great series. But, uh, it does not show the, the uh, theme of well, apart from the, the ruinous state you can now see of the North Transept. Uh, by this stage, there were houses literally built against the east end over there. Um, and you can see another of the, these sort of billy type houses with sort of Georgianized windows. Um, we've even got the Carter here delivering something. Um, we've got a lot of nice detail actually in the lamplight down there in the middle at the bottom. Um, and what I was saying about the, um, the Patrick's North Close being a sort of thoroughfare, we didn't have a real sense of that. There's a lot of activity there on the north side um, of the cathedral. Uh, the washing, of course, hanging out of the window as well. It's a delightfully picturesque town, the Victorian Art Museum and collection. Of course, there were people who thought that things should be improved, and uh, this introduces us here to Richard Carpenter, a British architect who made um, various um, visits um, to Dublin in the 1840s, and he exhibited large ink and wash drawings at the Royal Devon Academy, showing what he thought should be done um, with the cathedral. Um, here we have a new, uh, it's the hexagonal chapter house, Envisaged, um, which uh, would have been modelled probably on Salisbury uh, uh, Cathedral, rather like the Lady Chapel or an inn, which uh, uh, again he took some inspiration from and it was uh, restored. Uh, and there's a whole assemblage of additional chapels and probably uh, ancillary uh, buildings to the, the vestry, which you see have been attached here to the, to the north side of the building. In the popular eye, though, this was how they were now seeing the cathedral, that this heavily romanticised image, uh, which was made by William Henry Bartlett, is a, a, a British travel illustrator. He was in um, Ireland, in France, even in America. Um, and uh, his work is uh, very accomplished, uh, but he does like to put a certain mood on it, and you get very much the sense of that here as we, we look from the east end of the cathedral um, uh, to all the activities um, going on. This is a, one of many illustrations that he did for Paul's Ireland. Um, and of course, they weren't just in book form by the stage, they were actually produced um, individually. Uh, here we have a, a detail, and it's a, a, a real, real cross section. You've got a sort of a, a, a proto Irish car in the, in, in the open carriage there in the middle. The, the middle glasses, you've got the, the poor Irish women in their shawls on the left, and of course you've got the drunkards. Uh, one of the houses uh, was clearly converted to a tavern, and there it is on the right hand side, um, some man being supported by a couple of friends, and sort of, you see it comes out of it. Um, and then we really get the sense of this, it's almost like a street as we look into the distance, and Patrick Street. He also um, got recycled a bit. Um, I, I rather like this little vignette. Um, Jay Marchant um, produced it for a lithograph map. Again, it's very much bound up with what's happening in, in Ireland. 1849, Queen Victoria had been her first visit. Um, famine officially ends 1850, and there's this new sense of, sort of prosperity and you know, positivity in, in the country. And this particular map um, was produced in 1851. Um, with little vignettes and buildings, but uh, you'll note that he has really sanitized that view by Bartlett. He's got rid of all the unpleasant elements. And we've just got our picturesque locals and the um, carriage there in the distance. It's very small. Um, uh, the assemblage you see here, if 
actually on an um, I.O. and uh, you can see it's obviously folded at some point. It's quite delightful to have not just the cartography, but also the little um, buildings. Uh, you know, John's Castle, Limerick, for instance, Common Noise, uh, the base of Killarney. It's very much a sort of romanticized um, island, even down to the little shambles right at the top. This particular aspect um, was replicated and it was all continued. I mean, the uh, other artists obviously even sketched it, but the, it's rather like Morton, who thinks the south view, the north view becomes uh, really the same one. Uh, we still got that tavern building there, just uh, slightly appearing. The first um, image I've actually seen is the railings that were put up to separate it from the cathedral proper. Um, and uh, you can see that the um, transept is now fully rebuilt. Um, and there really is an air of prosperity here. We've actually got one of Bianconi's cars, which ran across Ireland, the first uh, Irish transport system. And in the 1880s, by Michael F. Daniel, not so important to the building, but again, I mean, the detail is fascinating. Um, we've even got lampposts now appearing, as you can see there in the foreground. <coughs> and then, once the Guinnesses have paid to sweep away all the slums, they become a on the side, right up to the uh, Ivy buildings, which they were to fund, um, the creation of the St. Patrick's Park. Um, this is one of these superb photographs that Robert French um, produced. Uh, he joined the photographic studio of William Mervyn Lawrence um, and spent 40 years there, the base of seven upper Sackville today, O'Connell Street. They're their chief photographer um, and their um, most uh, of the images of survivor by him, some 40,000 glass plates now in the National Library. Um, not just a, a great um, so perspective that he often records, but the, the actual Christmas and focus that he achieves is over a large distance here. Um, this particular house on the left hand side had long been there, but not been built, as you can see, and we now have a, an actual balustrade separating the, um, the north close, which has, has dwindled really to a park. Um, uh, you no longer get the sense that it's actually a street as it was um, crossing over from Patrick Street in the distance to the Bride Street where we're standing. I'm not exactly sure where we're standing. You might have to go right up into a rooftop to actually get this view. It's, it's a wonderful visual record of the time. This is a little earlier, but um, it's uh, you know, how the artist rather more can see things. Um, it's another of these maps with vignettes. Edward Heffernan in 1868 decided to use Dublin in the suburbs. As the cathedral, uh, we've got a, a carter here in, in the foreground with his hay, which is a, a, a nice and specific um, detail. And here is the map itself. Um, the buildings themselves um, are, are very nice, particular views, but it, it, it's really great. It's one of the first to actually show you right in the suburbs, all the way down um, to, to Donnybrook and the whole of the expanse of Phoenix Park, which is, is, is bigger than Central Park in New York. And you really get a sense of how it's uh, almost the same size as the city centre itself. This is a bit yellow, but it's sort of varnish on at some point, and this is rather yellow with time. We do have the gallery, um, it's got a lovely painting by Walter Osborne, of course, was very much drawn to the picturesque side of the, the Dublin slums, um, and he went out with not just his sketchbook, but actually with photographs. Um, uh, here we are looking um, down. Um, Patrick Street. He has these rather uh, delightful little titles uh, Near St. Patrick's Close, an old Dublin street. Um, and um, uh, as you can see, there was then a very lively market of uh, the, the uh, fish and vegetables on sale here. Uh, in 1910, um, Alderman Tom Kelly, uh, who was writing articles on Old Dublin for the Sinn Fein magazine, um, described how the open air market uh, store owners had been persuaded to relocate to Ivy Buildings because now it's all closed up and so the future is in doubt. Um, for their health, um, not as he said that it seems to have affected the previous generation. So obviously, it was a real instance of corporation um, cleaning up the city to make it uh, 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 sort of. Uh, 
less less than so picturesque, but also uh, taking you know, the, the library out of it. I mean, they're actually, you know, it's got it's in buildings, but the um, the whole library that's obviously has long gone. Um, of the cathedral itself, um, we're looking obviously at the Minot Tower, um, and uh, it's all rather lost in a sort of a, a, sort of a foggy vaporousness. Uh, it definitely captured the, the grey Dublin skies. Now I, I'm reverting in date um, because uh, like I mentioned the Guinnesses, and um, this is really to show you the incredible transformation that happened just outside, let alone inside the building. We have here a very rare view of the Archbishop's Palace. Um, it had been uh, built way back in the 13th century, but it kept getting altered. Uh, it's basically three sides of a courtyard, and when Marsh's Library was built, uh, the first phase about 1703, and then the 1708 09, the second wing, um, it literally abutted it. At this date, there was actually still a tower between them. Um, which was a telescope used for astronomy, but I've yet to find any image of that. In 1805, the palace had been sold to the state by the then Archbishop, and it was actually used for barracks by 18, uh, uh, that year. Um, the police had arrived in the 1830s, and of course, as you know, the, the Gardaí were here uh, until very recently. They built their um, spanking new premises on the corner of Bride Street. Um, I uh, learned only a week ago that the Office of Public Works, which does belong to the state, um, have now moved in and they are planning to restore the palace to give you some sense of what it was like in the past. Um, there are quite a lot of bits of features left, the old doorway um, uh, and uh, obviously the walls themselves. Um, it's not big enough to make it a great civic museum, but obviously when it's done, I'm afraid, afraid it's going to be a few years, um, it will be obviously a great part of the whole St. Patrick's Cathedral complex to have that um, you know, a, a, as part of it. Now back to the review, um, at this point there was a very solid wall between him and the dean, of course there's a little bit of antipathy between the, um, the two, um, uh, and uh, you really do see uh, how closely grouped all the other buildings in the, um, the South Close are around the, the deanery. Also captures a bit of the street activity and, and the figures going by. Um, here we see post Guinness um, when they drove this um, new road through, um, and uh, it was a, a very good decision because it does actually open up the whole cathedral. Um, the uh, the deanery is nicely protected by battlemented walls. Um, the no idea of what's going on behind them. Uh, this is an undated etching. Uh, the 1870s or 1880s. And uh, here you see um, on, a, on a map of the period um, that, uh, as uh, the dean himself pointed out to me, I had before I noticed it, the um, Guinnesses thought it would be rather nice that part of that street was known as Guinness Street, but the name did not hold. Um, uh, you can see this of the layout here at the bottom, um, and there's a Rather interesting canon, Ralph Sadler, who uh, um, did some photographs. That the only one um, uh, actually seen, he must have done more, but it actually shows you the, um, the actual practicalities of the reconstructing of the transept, which is the south one. I guess you could have bored it all up, put up your scaffolding or whatever. And then um, one of the postcards that was produced later in the century, it's been sort of colourised. It looks like a black and white photograph, um, but you can now see how well established um, the churchyard has become with all the, the new memorials that have been put in. I filled a whole page with all the improvements that the Guinnesses brought and what they repaired. Um, uh, the thing was that they of put so much money in that they decided that uh, they really Guinness it would run things. It wasn't, he, that was his agreement. It, he, was in charge and he, and he would do whatever he felt was right. So he used um, stone contractors of the Murphy family, particularly Patrick Murphy, um, who probably did this design for the, the door which you um, came in um, today at the West End. Um, but uh, a lot was really his um, vision. We'll come back to the, the Guinnesses. Um, 
quickly whiz through the West Front, which we haven't actually looked at yet. Um, one of the earliest views is in the background of the Port of the Squid, that uh, was commissioned by the, um, the, the, the canons uh, to celebrate the great Dean. Um, and yet again, John Blamar, this time not the engraving, but the original drawing, to show you um, how different the feel was at the West Front when you had an early medieval door and um, a window that had been in place in the 15th century that was uh, collapsed at the vault, um, and of course, no spire on the tower. Uh, it was engraved as an extant um, by Andrew Miller, a little clearer. And in the Gander's collection of both these items, um, you can see um, really how truncated it feels. Uh, we can see some of the, the shops of the butchers there beyond the cathedral, and a little ruin that was associated with where St. Patrick originally baptized people on the site, when in fact the, the poddle went all the way around the cathedral, hence the is known as being an insular or on, a, on an island. Um, this is actually cross puddle where we're standing, um, uh, just to show the obviously where we are now, uh, and the first actual proper view by the architect James Gandon, um, which uh, again just shows this all the sense the soaring quality, which is so gothic and uh, appropriate to it. Minute Town is actually the second town on the site, because again, it was a, a, a careless fire due to um, the sexton in the 14th century. The first one burnt down uh, as part of the, um, uh, 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 when the part of the, the, the nave uh, aisle collapsed, and so they had to rebuild it. There's Darius Cross Poddle, you can see, which is a, originally just a, a ford across the river, and then it becomes covered up. And like so many of Dublin's rivers, they're still there. Just you don't see them until they become troublesome and they start flooding. Those are the shops again in the distance. I was wondering why Morton didn't put the spire, and of course, then we realize that actually he's thinking horizontally, it just doesn't fit and it expires and um, literally truncates the, the building. Um, again, you can see the um, great accuracy of which he records the features which were there at the time. Uh, even these rather fine gates um, and the um, castellated um, the wall that uh, was alongside the cathedral. And of course the more humble members sort of driving the cattle literally to the centre of the city um, and the butchers going about their work in the distance with the um, little shops literally attached to the earlier late 17th, early 18th century houses. Mr. Carpenter had ideas also for the West Front, so this is his idea for um, an enhanced tower with crocketing um, and also to build up the entrance uh, to give it a triangular pediment to look rather grander than, uh, as you can see, it has uh, perhaps remained. Uh, the window here is one that's put in um, when the Guinness restoration was done. The cathedral itself was heavily divided, literally, because um, the, the choir was cut off from the nave by a pulpit and screen. Um, the chapter house had been sort of squashed into the south transept and walled off. And so your know, experience of visiting the building was not now even this great vista, um, but very much um, small compartments. We have in the Gannis collection this delightful drawing um, done about 1805 to 10 by George Miller, um, uh, who uh, worked in ink and wash, as you can see. So quite a large sheet, but very informative. This is the North Isle looking down um, through the North Transept after it had been um, removed. Um, and you would have um, this dramatic shaft of light. I'm not quite sure the sunlight ever quite comes through the North side like that, but certainly he wanted to bring out the lovely figures you can see here, and you can see the, the tiled floor, a uh, disparity of monuments at that time, so many um, were put in in the 19th century. And of course, um, a, a, a quite close in the field, so this is a photograph from the mid-1930s, um, when if you position yourself carefully enough, it still looks rather empty. Uh, today, um, a film, this is one of the 80s, 80s monuments uh, with memorials, um, and of course, uh, you look through to the nave itself and you can see how much of the stonework has been replaced, um, how the, the clear story, the triforium, uh, uh, all that, uh, uh, the 
this column and an arch has been lost, just literally collapsed with the various um, families that have occurred in the building. Plus the fact, of course, there was no vaulting in the aisle at the time. Passing uh, the best and most famous sculpture in the cathedral, um, the bust of Jonathan Swift, so presented by his publisher George Faulkner, um, it has moved around. I mean, you, you forget how um, frequently the monuments themselves um, get uh, pushed around the building. Uh, it was originally um, in, if I forget, uh, in the nave facing inwards. Um, bust of Swift and then the inscription about him below. Uh, it started to collapse. Uh, you can see it literally shored up with wood here. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a, a rather nice um, account um, of when the writer Walter Scott visited Dublin um, that he had to get a ladder in order to go and have a closer look at the bust. Um, as we said, uh, uh, this is the, the, the writer um, John Gibson Lockhart, his close friend, but, uh, he, wrote, he wrote to his wife, one thinks of nothing but Swift here. The whole cathedral is dedicated to him. Your papa seemed vexed that there was not a ladder at hand that he might have got nearer the bus. Um, he thought it was by the Billiac, the French stuff, the fact that he meant about that fact of coming in. Then they recited it um, on the same wall where it now is, but quite high, you've got the inscription stereo on the sides. So now, as you see, it's going down the wall. Even what we think of as fixed entities are quite mobile. We were looking at the name, and this is the only view we actually had from the um, early 19th century that really shows the full extent of it. Obviously, the, the losses we were seeing in the stone work, but also the fact that it had um, lost its forms so way back in the 16th century, and now it was some wooden rafters. But we're going to be um, looking particularly at, or then out today, of course, as you see, all nicely placed. The very interesting memorials here um, there's one to Archbishop Smith in the centre there, um, and to the Earl of Cavan on the right hand side, um, and the Fifth on the left hand side, none of which is still there, because Smith has gone to the South of France, so the Benjamin Guinness thought it looked much better then, in fact, you can get a better view of it. Earl of Cavan has gone to the West End and stuck quite high on the wall. It's a very fine armorial um, assemblage, even down to the, um, the very realistically clear drum. And that Plinth has been, become very useful because the statue that's uh, said to be St. Patrick, certainly someone uh, who's a bishop, uh, probably from the 14th century, has now got it's over there in the south transept. And here is the full effect of the Guinness Restoration. I mean, you really, I say, you, you, you are in a, a building that survived intact. It's gone through a lot of um, troubles, uh, uh, very fine Victorian tiles. The views of the choir, um, which uh, again show the sort of big changes, uh, where in a strangely empty choir at this stage, where we're sort of looking in this direction um, towards this pulpit and screen and the earlier um, organ that was there. Rather more informative um, unknown artist from around 1820, um, who is very accurate, um, showing particularly these two galleries that were put up. Uh, the reason was the Knights of St. Patrick's um, flags, um, we've seen briefly, in which are uh, uh, now positioned in the choir again. Um, their ceremony of installation took place here, and um, five of them. 1783, 1821, and they needed extra seats. Uh, at one point in 1821, there were 729 people present, so a, a lot of people. Uh, very nice in the woodwork. Probably Francis Johnson, the architect who uh, designed this, this portion we're, we're looking at, an artist, Harris, organ at the time. Um, and coming in, you can see these uh, box pews, which are very, very typically sort of Georgian. The Dublin Penny Journal gives you more sense of the um, human activity. We've got a service in progress here, so a tiny little um, engraving. For 
more accuracy we turn again to the guidebooks, this is the uh, picturesque views of the antiquities of Ireland, um, where you can see the, the very early pulpit, the one that Tony Swift is said to preach from, which is now um, migrated to the nave. And of course, another monument that uh, found legs. Um, uh, the, the other court used to be behind the high altar until he was ejected in the 17th century. Um, but um, the, the one that we see um, here um, of Archbishop Thomas Jones um, stayed for a while, it's now moved um, probably by Edward Tino in the uh, early 17th century, the Dublin sculptor. I think it was all part of this being nearer to God than nearer he was in the East End, so when they liked their big tombs, because the people also saw more, uh, more in public. Uh, one of the most informative views, though, um, frustratingly anonymous artist about 1840s, a very, very large watercolour, with some idea of this big um, Victorian frame on the right hand side, um, and you can see the detail that's being included, um, which uh, is fascinating to see now. Um, in some senses, things don't look much different now. This is actually a, a 1784 plaster vault we're looking at. It wasn't until 1901 it was replaced. It's actually concrete today, um, the vault up there in the choir. It's coming in and... And where we are now, um, in the Lady Chapel, before it was revamped um, by uh, Mr. Richard Carpenter, who we've met already, um, very different. It had lost its vaulting, flat, flat plaster roof, uh, the uh, usage was slightly different. Uh, coming into the detail there, you can see it was actually being used for meetings uh, for uh, several centuries. The Huguenots had used it as their chapel. And um, rather nice detail, just something just looking closer, is a, a little dressing area, like a vestry on the right hand side with a mirror and a towel for the, um, for the uh, cleric to get ready before it came out, and what looked like framed notices on the outside. So, it really had a rather cluttered air. Uh, this is after Carpenter had recreated it. He was very lucky that the screen arches um, for the vaults were there, um, and he found under the floor the original positions um, of the columns. Um, he hadn't got the money, and we were talking when he did this in the uh, mid 1840s, we were sort of famine time, um, to do a stone vault. It is plaster. But um, he did a wonderful recreation job. For some reason, Guinness wanted to get rid of this whole section and rebuild it, but um, uh, perhaps they didn't have time, so it never happened. But it was certainly a, a lovely um, building. Um, only uh, about five years ago, it was given a major overhaul and tidied up. And now um, it looks very pristine again. And, and like the court, it, is, it is very much used. Um, uh, some of the biggest coral here, I've seen it in last year, it's culture night. Now, after all, in a sacred building. Carpenter was a keen follower of the ecclesiologist, uh, ecclesiology movement. Something in Cambridge 1834, the ecclesiologist, where that lithograph uh, was published, was their magazine, um, and they were promoting not just a study of Gothic architecture, but its reuse in church building. The idea that not just to bring back proper medieval architecture, but the whole spirit to actually improve people. The things you find up in architects being the, the right architecture will produce the right um, sensibility um, in the, the people visiting the buildings. So here's an idea that while um, someone is not so far from what was to happen, but um, the, the tiles are less um, elaborate, even the, the corner stools, um, and you can see that uh, uh, it's all a bit more grandiose uh, in, in the sort of Guinness um, restoration. He did propose a rather nice screen. You see, we have, we have gates now um, in metal. Um, I think this didn't find favour um, because it's too high. The idea was to open up the cathedral fine because you really got the sense of looking right through it. Um, also, of course, there was no money. They were looking for 40 to 50,000. And although he published a set of six lithographs based on his ink and wash drawings that he was exhibiting, uh, he couldn't see the project through. His idea of the organ was rather nicer, I think, because with the choir and the main nave organs, um, rather than being all concealed up there, the pipes in two stories, so you've actually seen it in public view. It does also um, uh, here really show you just how um, small the choir is. In the, in the first view, it looked much deeper. 
1865, 24th of February, about 3,000 people turned up for the reopening. The prime seats were in the south transept, um, and the reason was that you were opposite the new pulpit, um, uh, and that's where the Guinnesses sat, and uh, the Illustrated London News gives you some sense of the, um, the massive people who thronged the um, very few seats um, at this time. Uh, here, another of the, the French photographs, and this lovely little um, lane, um, which is the link across from the deanery. Uh, of course, the, 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 the new close existed, but it's always a pain to have to walk around the corner. So the, the dean, um, even now, if you cut through, it's still there, that lane, um, behind that green gate on the right-hand side, that's the 1872 school that was put up in the, the modern grammar school on the left-hand side. And a great service in progress after the reopening. Um, one of these stereo photographs that were produced um, uh, at the um, uh, later 19th century. Uh, it big confused, it's the same image basically, but when you put the two together in the, the right machine, you, you get an incredible sense of 3D. And penultimately, um, Got a nice thing at the Victorian Harbour Museum, which has been modelled in wood by Thomas Drew for the spiral staircase that actually takes you up to the organ loft. Um, it's a lovely little architect's model, and of course you don't get, you can't see this now because it's all embedded in the walls. Um, uh, it was both inspired by the Mind's Mine, Cathedral, um, so it's a, a lovely little sort of uh, treasure. Uh, the Ar Irish Architectural Archive now make a great thing of collecting architects' models which are fascinating to have, uh, but of course in the past they generally got just thrown out. Uh, there was a horrible fire in 1940 um, which destroyed a lot of the choir stalls and so the, uh, the builders Crampton um, were brought in and they replaced them. They, they, they didn't look any different, but uh, it was another, another unexpected project. And finally, one of the best views probably in the city from the deanery looking across to the cathedral itself um, from the uh, inside, and this is the, the, the dean's garden. Um, but as in life, not everything, of course, is perfect. Of course, as you can see, the, the shadow of the house throws, which is the cathedral itself, is if you, if you really want to get the sun, you have to put your back to the cathedral. But there's one in here that does, uh, uh, it's not like a uh, all these little pockets of hidden Dublin which are lurking over behind the walls. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I ran a little over time. But, uh...